So keep, please keep uh, introducing yourselves, um, and I think we'll get started. We still have people that are logging on, but um, we would love for you to say hi when you when you get settled. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you very very much for registering for this webinar, selecting and assessing health equity tools. Um, if you have any challenges with audio or with the PowerPoint, please let us know with a message in the chat box, um, and we'll do what we can to help fix that. Um, the audio, as the first slide says here, the audio is by telephone or computer. You don't need to log into um, both. Some of you um, may not be watching, it may have a PDF of the slides and may not be watching the slides progress, so we'll do our best to um, say what slide we're on so you, you can follow along really well. And um, keep, like I said, keep introducing yourself. And I think with that, we will go ahead and get started. Oh, and look, I see someone from Yellowknife. So um, that's really wonderful. Um, so we are going to be um, having lots of time for questions at the end of the webinar in the last half hour. If um, there are any questions that you have, please put them up through the chat box, and we're going to keep track of them along um, the side and ask them during the question and answer period. Um, certainly, also, if you've got comments and want to interact with each other during the webinar, then um, that's a great idea to do in the chat box as well. So today, we've got, uh, you'll have here two, um, we are here one main facilitator, and that's me, Diane Oichel. And I'm an knowledge translation specialist with the National Collaborating Center. And right now I'm sitting in beautiful Anaganesh, Nova Scotia. It's, it's clear and sunny and uh, a really lovely winter day. Um, behind the scenes we have Danielle McDonald, and she's our brilliant research assistant who is um, pulling all the technological strings here and um, has been a huge support today. So um, thank you very much to Danielle. And as most of you likely um, may already know, we are um, one of six national collaborating centers for public health. Um, our other centers are located in different locations across the country. Um, national Collaborating Center for Aboriginal Health is in British Columbia. Our Center for Environmental Health is also in BC. Infectious Disease is in Winnipeg. Healthy Public Policy is in Montreal. Um, and the Methods and Tools is in Hamilton, Ontario. So um, we are at St. FX University in Antigonish. And because of where we're located, I do want to um, acknowledge that we're located in Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral territory of Mi'kmaq people. And we are honoring this land, um, recognizing Indigenous resistance, and as a call to us all that we need to remember our responsibilities as treaty people. And this responsibility really calls on us to pay attention to ongoing colonial processes and move towards undoing some of those growth inequities that have been the result of that. Um, and we're very grateful to be here. And this is a little bit about us, the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health. Um, our focus is on the social determinants um, and, and how those social determinants intersect and accumulate over the life course to produce health inequities in the population. And our main audience is public health focus. So um, a lot of our materials and, and messages are focused on public health process, but certainly are adaptable and have been um, picked up and used by other sectors um, as well. So we're going to go to our first poll. Um, some of this is coming through in the chat box in terms of where you work, but we really do want to um, have a visual that everybody can see. So um, do a quick vote to scan to see where everybody works. So got a little bit of BC, Ontario, the biggest, um, the biggest population focus, of course. Um, so mostly Ontario, it looks like a few from Alberta, a few from BC. I know there's an Northwest Territories up there. <laughs> looks like there's a Nunavut out there as well, so that's very exciting. Oh, this is great, you guys. This is a really great representation. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm always really thrilled the more areas across the country that we can reach, um, the better. And so today the focus is really on the use of health equity tools. And um, this has been a really 
developing an ongoing area of focus for me over the past year. And last year, um, we worked with the presenters today, um, along with some other partners, to um, develop a session on the use of health equity tools as part of the CPAJ conference. And leading up to that, I had discussions with many, many people about um, tools and you know what a tool is and, and what does a tool actually mean and I had a particularly meaningful conversation with someone who's on the line today I want to do a, an acknowledgement to my former colleague Tanith Brown at the Lee's Gun Lanark District Health Unit in Brockville Ontario and Tanith and I had a great she's a health equity lead there and I had a great conversation about um, you know, which comes first, the, the chicken or the egg? Which comes first, the tool or the action? And, and sometimes tools themselves can be a catalyst for action, and sometimes um, there needs to be other actions taken in order to facilitate the use of tools. And so as we go forward um, with this discussion today, um, that keep that sentiment in mind, that um, there's no perfect order and there's no perfect tool that will fit every work environment uh, and that will fit every scenario and, and certainly the use of tools and the ability to take action on health inequities from a population perspective really depends on an organization's capacity to be able to do that work. So um, what we're presenting here today around metaphors and tools really fits into a bigger context of public health practice. So it will be really interesting to have some discussion around that. Um, as we go through the, the question answer period. So this is an overview today of our objectives. Um, and what I'm going to do when I pass it over to our speakers here, um, use, I'm asking you to use these objectives as you fill out our evaluation. And I'll put up the link to the evaluation in the participant chat box. If you need to leave early, please fill out the evaluation. Please give us some good, honest feedback and use these objectives to guide um, the feedback that you give us. We really, really do go back to the evaluation data to um, help us plan further webinars and also what other topics we should be focusing on for our audience. So with that, um, I am going to jump right into introducing today's speakers. We have two speakers on the line from two different areas in British Columbia. Our first speaker, speaker is Bernie Pauley, and Dr. Pauley is an associate professor in the School of Nursing at the University of Victoria. She's a scientist at the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research. She is the nominated principal investigator for the Equity Lens and Public Health Project. So you'll hear uh, some of us refer to the ELLIS project. She's leading research on the application of health equity in public health systems in BC. She's a member of the Public Health System Services Research Initiative. She's co-leading researcher. Um, on the implementation of harm reduction policies and programs. And she really is very much on the ground working with people who are struggling um, with substance use. And she is the Island Health Scholar in Residence and the University of Victoria Community Engaged Scholar. Sana Sharam is our speaker as well, and she is a Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research Health Policy Fellow with the ELF Project. And she's also with the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research. She's an embedded health equity scholar in Interior Health Population Public Health Department. So she's speaking with us today from Kelowna, BC. And she's also a member of our advisory board, and her input has been really, really valuable. Her research interests include indigenous approaches to health equity research, the social determinants of substance use during pregnancy, and also knowledge mobilization that disrupts the systemic roots of inequitable outcomes. So we have two really brilliant, strong women to today to um, take us through the use of health equity tools. And with that, I am going to pass it over, I think, to Bernie first. Thanks, ladies. Great. Thanks, Diane. I like the brilliant and strong women. I really <laughs> like that. That's one of my favorites. That's going to be one of my new favorite um, intros. I want to begin by acknowledging, um, with respect, that the University of Victoria is on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. That includes the Songhees, a Esquimalt and Wasanic uh, peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue today. And uh, at the University of Victoria, um, there's been a real uh, commitment and ongoing recognition of colonization and how that's impacted attitudes, policies, and, and very institutions ourselves that have contributed um, to health inequities. 
Um, I, as Diane mentioned, I'm uh, the nominated principal applicant on the ELF project, which is the Equity Lens in, in Public Health, which was a CIHR-funded uh, study. And so Sana, uh, who's been a postdoctoral fellow with us, um, is and I today are presenting um, on behalf of the ELF team around health equity tools. Um, so we've had this big project for about six years because in British Columbia and, and in other province, provinces, there was a focus on wanting to understand how do we uh, apply or integrate a health equity lens in public health and recognize and better understand the role of public health in contributing to knowledge, knowledge as to how to reduce um, health inequities. Um, so what I'm going to do is just very briefly um, say a bit more about the ELF project, and then we're going to dive in and start thinking about um, health equity tools. Then Sana is going to take you through some activities around the use of kind of a, a unique approach to using health equity tools, and then I'm going to talk a bit about um, the ELF health equity tools um, inventory. You can see on the next slide, we have a map of British Columbia. The ELF project um, is composed of partnerships with all of the health authorities um, in British Columbia, as well as Public Health Ontario, Public Health um, Agency of Canada as well, and the National Collaborating Centers uh, for the Determinants of Health. So we have both um, regional and uh, national partnerships on this project, and it's been a pleasure to work with NCCDH um, in this work. So the ELF project itself um, was composed, sorry, composed of four studies. And the one we're going to focus in on is health equity tools. And you, if you've heard other health presentations, you may have heard us talking about intersector, or some of our research around intersectoral collaboration. We've talked about health equity, how it gets prioritized, and strategies for health equity action. And then we've also talked about ethics and equity in public health. And so as I said today, we're going to talk about um, one part of the ELF project, which is around health equity tools. So when we started this, we had three questions, which you can see on the slide um, right now, around what health equity tools are available. And so we're going to share with you um, in the latter part of the presentation around um, the number of health equity tools that we found and have put together into an inventory. Um, but we also want to share with you the theoretical relevance of those tools and practical utility, because it's one thing to find a tool. It's another thing to determine if it's the right tool and whether it's theoretically sound or if it's even just practically useful um, to use. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, just to get us going, um, I just have a question for you. Um, for those of you who've used a health equity tool, did you use it, abandon it, adapt it, or develop your own tool? And um, thanks, uh, Danielle's put it up. And I can see, I love this. I can see that people are um, responding. That's fantastic. I'm just going to give a minute or so um, as people respond um, to that. Right now, um, you can see that the largest group of people have adapted it. And that's, I would say that's a pretty common experience where people find a tool, um, but it's just not quite suited to their context, or it's not quite um, what they're looking for. And so they often adapt it uh, to try to make it fit better. Um, I'm really impressed. I'm seeing right now about 26% of people used it. Um, and then uh, the next group, about 12% identified that they developed their own. And it's interesting, uh, when we first started this work uh, more than about six or seven years ago, one of the reasons we included this study is that many of the partners we were working with in British Columbia said, you know, we really want a health equity tool, um, but 
either there's not a lot out there or we can't find the one that we really want. And so people were really doing a lot more development of their own tools. So my guess is, is if we had done this poll five years ago or 10 years ago, we would have more likely had people saying that they were developing their own tools or um, they were, um, as in this one, the top is that people are adapting it for use. And so we'll talk a bit more about finding um, the right tool for the right purpose, because sometimes that's part of the um, issues. So before um, we talk about the health equity tools inventory specifically, um, Sana and I had an opportunity, along with some of our other team members, Tina Ravai and, and Folk Dang, to work with uh, Leslie Dick, who was at the NCCDH, around the idea of using metaphors as a tool. And one of the reasons why we um, included metaphors, although they're not in the health equity tools inventory, we include, it, we include them as a tool, is because in our research, people identified that one of the most challenging issues that they had in trying to integrate health equity into public health systems was being able to communicate to others what health equity meant. And so, um, you know, simply putting up definitions um, wasn't necessarily moving people towards understanding. So I think, you know, we all have a good, we're all, you know, many of us are working in public health. I notice people from, you know, uh, working in public health services to, to education and teaching in public health as well as uh, students on the line. And so I think one of the challenges is how do we talk to each other about what we mean by health equity and how do we get that really deep understanding of what health equity means that goes beyond a definition. And so that was um, why we worked together with Leslie around uh, developing the use of metaphors as a tool for examining health equity. So I'm going to turn it over to Santa, who's going to walk you through a bit of background and then some activities, and then we're going to go into talking specifically about um, the ELF inventory that we developed. So over to you, Santa. Great. Thank you, Bernie. Um, can everybody hear me? Maybe in the chat box. I just want to make sure I'm speaking loud enough. Okay, perfect. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that I am joining you um, from Kelowna, British Columbia, and that I'm joining you from the traditional unceded territory of the Silk Nation. Um, and thank you so much, Bernie, for a wonderful introduction. So I'll just skip right ahead into our content. Um, so as Bernie mentioned, I'm sure everyone on the line has a pretty good understanding of the definition of health equity, but I just wanted to throw it up here um, as we get going. Uh, it says difficult to hear you. Okay. Most people can hear, so I'll keep going unless I'm told otherwise. Um, but so health equity means all people have a fair chance to reach their full health potential. Um, something I always like to put up is the definition of health inequity. Um, and again, I know a lot of people are quite familiar with this definition, um, but I just want to just draw attention to <clears throat> the three distinguishing features of health inequity, and that's that they're systemic, sorry, systematic, which means that their distribution is not random, and they show consistent patterns across the population, and also the second distinguishing feature, which is that they're socially produced. So differences are not determined biologically, they're not fixed, they're not inevitable. And I just want to draw attention to these features because, um, A, the reason we talk about health and equity and health equity in public health is because there's something that we can do about it. Um, but also, I really want to start encouraging people when we're communicating about health equity is to really take a hold and take ownership of the fact that the evidence is irrefutable. Health inequities are rooted in maldistribution of wealth, resources, and power and privilege. And so we don't need to always um, sort of get bogged down in this idea that we need to keep showing evidence that proves um, that health inequities are real, that they're inevitable, and that we have a role to play in um, making a more equitable society. The third distinguishing feature um, is this idea that health inequities are unfair, so that they're generated and maintained by unjust social arrangements. So this is really, I think, where um, we get to the root of why health equity work can be challenging. Um, because 
fairness in a lot of ways depends on the meaning attributed by different people to the idea of what is fair and what's unfair. So if we look at um, the sort of movement around health equity, it really started to gain uh, momentum in 2008 with the re release of the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. Um, and that was with the report with Michael Marmot stating that social injustice is killing people on a grand scale. At the same time that this report came out, the former Director General Margaret Chan made a statement that said that this report ends the debate decisively. However, um, I think we all know that this did not, in fact, end the debate decisively. And it's actually something that we all continue to really grapple with in public health as well as society at large. And we've had numerous documents internationally, nationally, provincially, even regionally, that have echoed the findings of this commission, but we haven't really made a lot of traction. And I think one of the reasons um, that this has been so challenging um, is because it has to do with how Canadians understand health and understand concepts of fairness, for example. So if we look at the Canadian context, um, Canadians generally believe that we have a good knowledge of health issues and we consider health and healthcare to be top priorities. However, um, whenever uh, you look at any research or work that's done in this area, it turns out that Canadians are actually generally uninformed about the social determinants of health. And instead, we usually identify things like disease, illness, and healthcare as key health policy issues without any real recognition of the different impacts um, that influence our health and wellness. So uh, on the slide here, you'll see it's called What's in the Swamp of Health and Wellness in Alberta. And this is a piece of work that came out in um, 2014. The Chief Public Health Officer in Alberta commissioned research by the Frameworks Institute to learn about communicating about the social determinants of health and wellness. And their purpose was to build support for social policy to address the social determinants of health. Um, while the report was never fully released, you can actually find the research um, through the Frameworks Institute. And basically what they found was that the overarching challenge to creating social policy around the social determinants of health um, was this overarching idea of individualism that was at top of mind for people in Alberta when they talked about health. So this idea that health is linked to your lifestyle, individuals are responsible for their own health, um, and that if you just educate people, they could make better choices, and everyone's health is you. So really no understanding of the social patterns um, related to health um, or any connections between people's health or social policy or the um, built environment. So I think what this really illustrates in a very clear way is that communicating more effectively should be a core consideration in any health equity work. Um, so communications is uh, often identified as a core activity in public health. Um, if we're going to use uh, communication, I think it's really important to be clear that we're using communication as a tool um, that supports action. So it needs to be done as part of a larger strategy where you identify what is it that you want to change and how does communication allow you to make those changes. So one of the things that needs to be considered in that is who do you need to communicate? Often in public health, we need to communicate to varied audiences, and that means that we actually need to explain things and um, communicate in very different ways depending on who we're talking to and why. Um, and it also means that we really need to be cognizant of applying effective communication strategies around the social determinants of health and health equity. Um, and one of the really basic first steps of doing this, which is what we're going to be talking about, is being able to sort of identify the dominant worldviews and frames through which we understand health equity and the social determinants of health that then allow us to invite and encourage action. So when we're talking about health equity, um, again, this issue of fairness that sort of gets us tripped up when we're talking about equity, um, it really comes down to the fact that we often don't start with values and we make some assumptions based on the fact that everybody's coming at this from the same value system. However, when you look at um, values related to justice, the predominant um, value that we operate under as a society um, in our policies and our concepts around health actually lends itself to the concept of market justice. So market justice um, is a utilitarian theory that seeks to ensure fair protection of engagement in the market. So the aims of market justice are equality, so fairness in means 
or um, everyone has an equal opportunity. So it really lends itself to these concepts of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and individualism and that if everybody tries hard enough that they will have a chance um, at success. So it really focuses on the fact that inequalities in health and wealth are actually okay as long as people have equal access to opportunity. Um, and within market justice, you really see the naturalizing of power and privilege. However, when we're talking about health equity, um, something we really take uh, for granted is this concept that we are implicitly actually subscribing to a concept of social justice rather than market justice. So social justice places urgency on inequalities that result from systematic patterns of disadvantage. Um, and it aims for equity, so that's fairness in outcomes, not fairness in needs. And um, it stipulates that inequalities are socially constructed and that they lead to unacceptable inequities. Um, and within this frame, we problematize issues of power and privilege. And so really important to keep in mind that even at the very basic value, when we're talking about equity, we need to be really clear that we're talking from a lens of social justice rather than market justice. Uh, so one way to really make sure that you're communicating effectively is the use of explanatory chains. So explanatory chains uh, needs at least three links. So level one is where you start with a value. So this is the initial factor where you talk about the original cause of the problem you're trying to communicate about. So an effective chain, it actually starts um, a few steps back from the problem or symptom that the communicator wants to highlight so that someone who's new to the topic has access to the appropriate background information. So a well-framed explanatory chain begins with a systems level problem or underlying mechanism. So again, an example would be that you start to describe the different types of justice and the one that you're actually speaking to as a basic value. The second part of an explanatory chain is where you explain the issue. So this is where you bring in things like mediating factors. So what is set in motion by the initial factor? So you really, you're thinking about this concept of the domino effect. Um, and there may actually be many mediating factors that occur as a result of the initial factor. Um, but the mediating factor is what provides the explanation that links the initial factor or the problem to the final consequence. So this is where you can actually help the public see the circumstances as not being inevitable, and therefore that there can be a change in outcome in the final consequence. So this is really important because we don't always want to be um, talking from a perspective of crisis or um, ringing alarms to people, but without giving them any tangible ideas of how they have a role um, to play in this and why we're even bringing up the topic. If there's nothing we can change about it, what's the point of communicating about it? And so this is really where you start to get buy-in and start to build consensus for action. So the middle term is really the key to a satisfying explanation and it gives people the sense that they grasp the issue. The third level or link in an explanatory chain is where you introduce the solution. So this is the final consequence. What are the effects? The final consequence is the effect, result, or in, in, impact that you want to explain. Again, really important um, is that you don't want to just say the consequence, but an effective explanatory chain actually sets you up to communicate about solutions so that the public can become engaged once they understand the issue. So um, as we sort of have already been talking about, this really starts with framing issues effectively and that's when you start with values and then we're gonna speak to this idea of using metaphors or deep metaphors to move um, through the explanatory chain. So just a checklist for when you're using um, values to frame your problem effectively is that you wanna use values early to set up what's at stake and why it matters. So it's always important to really front load your conversations with values and to activate a collective civic orientation before getting into explanations or introducing possible solutions. Um, if you don't do this, the public, again, may not see that they have a role in considering the options for change, or they might think that they're already doing their part through their personal lifestyle choices. So when you want to frame those values, it's really important to rely on research recommended values. Value appeals are powerful because they widen the audience of people who will attend to a message, but you don't want to just make a, a guess about value, which value will work, and you don't want to assume that your, only deep, your own deeply held values will be effective for communication. So you want to use empirically tested values that are re recommended for the specific issue area that is the topic of communication whenever possible. So this concept of social justice versus market justice 
is an empirically tested effective value to start framing um, issues around health equity. Another thing to keep in mind when you're working with values is that you want to prime a civic mindset. So it's really easy when we're communicating about health and health equity to sort of slip back into individualism. So you don't want to start pointing to the fact that by doing health equity, um, you'll be improving the health of individuals because that starts slipping away from your bigger point um, that you're trying to create a collective um, civic responsibility around promoting health equity and you want to focus really on the community level or society level. So again, just drawing attention to the fact that while it seems really simple to communicate about these issues, they're really complex and so it requires a lot of um, forethought and careful consideration about how you're going to be um, making your message in a bit um, in a bit of a more impactful way. So we're just running a little bit uh, behind on time, so I'm going to go through the next few slides a little bit more quickly, but they do have um, writing on them if people want to visit them uh, closer um, on, at a later time. So this is just an example of some explanatory metaphors that came out of the work that was happening in Alberta where they identified what was actually um, really impactful to make that sort of um, explanatory link between health equity and what people could do in a way that was really clear and concise. So the resource grid, for example, shows how everybody is connected and it has to do with distribution of resources. Um, and I'll let you um, in your own time go through these other explanatory met metaphors a little bit more closely. But basically the takeaway message is that when we start to use metaphors after we framed a problem and a value, you can actually start to communicate really complex concepts about health equity action or health equity concepts and strategies in a way that generates a sense of collective responsibility as well as lets people feel really like they can grasp the idea that you're talking about. Um, so that brings us to our first activity, which I think we have a poll that we're going to use to go through it. Um, so this is just giving some examples about how we can use health equity metaphors critically and creatively um, to concisely um, communicate around um, health equity and health equity action. So the first activity is around creating key messages on health equity action. So I'm going to show you two pictures and we're going to ask people to write a caption or a tweet um, that captures the essence or key messages in each of these photos. So these are pretty common photos that people use when they're talking about health equity. Um, and so some questions for discussion is what do they say about equality? What is being said about equity? I think we have a poll here that people can type in some feedback. Okay, so we have an answer here, fairness and outcome, not opportunity. Not all is equal. Right. So equality is about providing everyone is not the same resource. Equity is about leveling up so those who are at a disadvantage. I'm not smaller, but the fence has been built higher in front of me. Some people need more help than others. Be part of the game. So differing needs, the fence represents the system inequality. Sameness in treatment outcome versus treatment and outcome that's based on need. Great. Sameness in treatment, great. Wonderful. So we're getting lots of um, comments around sort of um, that we're talking about different things in each of the, the photos. And so it's one example of how an image or a metaphor can actually be really powerful um, in talking about something that's in some ways very complex. Um, and then also some people are drawing attention to the fact that um, what's 
really going on is that the fence is representing um, system level um, inequities and also this difference between um, not just um, equality and opportunity, so everyone gets the same thing, um, but if we're talking about equity, is people more getting what they need? Um, some things that have happened when we've done um, this activity in a larger group with um, a bit more time to sort of get down into it is really some people have actually pointed out, which I thought was really interesting, that um, when we're using metaphors, we need to remember that we're not always talking to the converted, as we are in some ways to this room, and that somebody might actually look at this image and see the fact that you had to take away a box from the taller man on the end to give it to someone else. And so it actually is a represent representation of the fact that um, not everybody buys into equity because why should that person not get their box just because someone else needs a box? And so it's really important just to, as an activity, think critically through what it is that we're communicating, how we're communicating it, and how does it help us um, make, uh, make the impact that we want. Um, so I'm just going to move on to the next activity, which is um, somewhat similar. So we're going to show three pictures now. Um, and we're going to ask, what would you modify, what would you add, and what would you delete? So we have people answering all of the people working together to take down the fence, um, add women and girls, add diversity and individuals represented. I would change the setting. Baseball, baseball games are not relatable. I would talk about varying abilities, culture, having the bystanders take part in the play. Diversity and inclusion. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, take down the wall. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, change the setting. Make everyone the same height. Illustrate the barriers as more systematic. So having the bystanders take part in the play, giving people baseball gloves so that they can participate in the game. Um, these are all wonderful suggestions, and I think um, given the time that we have, we don't really have um, a lot of time to get into really deep discussion around this, but I think that the point um, that I hope that's coming across is that metaphors and images are really impactful tools um, for communicating around health equity, but they actually really need to be used very critically because as we see from um, the answers that we're getting, um, is everyone sort of has a different take on this, and everyone wants to take it um, in a different direction to start making really great points about the different complexities involved in health equity. And so just thinking about the fact that this is an image that gets used quite frequently, and it, al it often gets used quite um, uncritically because it does really, in a very simple way, communicate about equality versus equity. Um, but if we want to take it a bit further, um, one of the, sorry, can we move the poll? There we go. Um, one of the examples that um, has been drawn in these activities is this um, representation of equality, equity, and reality. And this is really drawing attention to the fact that um, a lot of times, even when we're talking about equality and equity, um, we're not necessarily looking at the health system and the structural barriers that are being produced. And that was what was coming out a lot in the poll as well. A lot of people were pointing to that. Um, and so we do some focus on barriers to accessing services, but not necessarily systemic barriers, such as racism, stigma, discrimination, and challenges related to public health advocacy, read the social determinants of health. And so really thinking through metaphors as a tool, it's a way to help us communicate, um, but we just need to really think about our explanatory chain, how we're linking these concepts together, and what is it that we really want to communicate at the end as our action. Um, and doing that in a, in a really clear, concise way as one tool um, for promoting health equity. 
So I just want to finish off with a checklist um, for using explanatory chains and metaphors. So it's really important for us to frame the underlying problem strategically. So we want to be sure to describe the issue in a way that would be recognized as an obvious problem to the average citizen. Um, but when we do that, we want to take care. So there's a lot of ways for us where we start a chain in that swamp that we saw in the Alberta Health and Wellness Swamp. Um, so we want to consider whether our first term is going to cue unproductive ways of thinking about the problem. And we always want to frame the problem in terms that lead clearly to a reasonable, easy to think collective solution so that we don't um, really overwhelm people with a crisis and then not give them any way to feel engaged or that they have a role to play in it. We also want to strike a balance between enough information and too much information. So uh, to paraphrase Albert Einstein, we want to use as few links as possible, but not fewer. Um, so we don't want to skip over important information or mechanisms. Um, and this is a tension and it's a challenge, but it's something that's really important to think through through careful writing and rewriting of your messaging to make sure you've given enough information, but you're not overwhelming people with information that distracts um, or confuses them from the point you're trying to make. Um, third, we want to frame the final consequence strategically. So we want to consider the thinking that would be activated by the final consequence. So that's, again, the, where a metaphor becomes really useful, where you start to sort of dissect what could come out of this metaphor that's unintended or not really speaking to our point. Um, and you always want to describe an impact of the final effect so that you don't leave the audience unsure whether the effect is a good thing or not. And you don't want to invoke crisis thinking. You want to use matter of fact um, tone so you don't leave the impression that this is a big, scary, depressing crisis that can't be solved. And finally, you always want to allow for consideration of appropriate solutions. So either the initial factor or the meeting, mediating factors, it's always important that you draw attention to parts of the problem that can be influenced by collective action and that can lead to systemic change. So in conclusion, um, some language, which is the norm in public health equity work, does not always resonate with audiences. Um, this communication messages need to be tailored for different audiences and effective framing in part through explanatory metaphors can be used as a tool to shift thinking and support long-term action to prove um, health equity. Um, and I just wanted to leave you with a question for reflection around how might you use metaphors in your practice to communicate health equity concepts more clearly. That's it for me. Thanks, Sana. Um, this is Bernie. And um, just as you're thinking about that question about how you might use metaphors in your practice to communicate health equity concepts, um, I think in our experience, um, we've done quite a lot of metaphors workshops um, with people in public health, and it's been really helpful for them to think about different ways to talk about health equity with people outside of public health using the metaphors. That's been one application. The other application um, has been about within public health, not that public health doesn't know what health equity is, but it's been really enlightening. Um, and Sam has, read, Sam has done some of this work in, in interior health, I think, to actually talk with each other in the same area where you work and use the metaphor as a jumping off point for having a conversation about how do we understand health equity. Um, and so the two applications are within public health so that we all have some shared understanding and set of values. Um, and I would say from our research, public health is so well um, centered in their values, but we don't always get a chance to talk about them and the metaphors gives a way to do that. And then the other really good application is to use it if you're talking outside of public health to other people in, in your healthcare organization, like in BC, we've got health authorities. Public health is situated in the health authorities. Um, so being able to talk to other parts of the healthcare system, like acute care. And then also um, with um, across sectors. And so I've done a couple workshops where we were talking with municipal planners um, and people who are intimately concerned with public health, but 
hadn't really thought about or engaged with health equity in the same way. So that was another application. Um, there's a question um, from Jill, has BC used this with the opioid crisis, which is a fantastic question because um, that's an area that I work in a lot. And I wouldn't say, I would say it's been, it hasn't been done explicitly, but I have to tell you it's something that um, I'm, I've been working on and had some conversations um, with other people. So thank you for that um, really important question because I think that's exactly where we would look at something like um, we're putting together uh, some more health resources and in one of them we're going to look at um, the overdose uh, or drug poisoning um, emergency. So in about the next 15 minutes or so, um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about um, the health equity tools inventory. Um, so we've given you metaphors as an example for talking within and outside of health systems about health equity, but we also wanted to put together a resource that had a broad range of tools in that could help people think about health equity either in their own program or in a policy or more broadly in the health system. So you see here um, on the right, the first inventory was developed in 2013 um, and um, we've updated that inventory since and you can find them both at www.uvec.ca slash elf, which is on the right hand side there. So as I mentioned, our first inventory was published in 2013. It had 35 tools in it, and we did a systematic search uh, to find it in both uh, the gray and published literature. Um, and then you can see in 2016, when we published a second inventory, there were 112 tools. So the number of tools had almost tripled um, as a bit of an indicator that there was absolutely more interest in people wanting to develop tools um, and resources for actually integrating and applying health equity. Here's our criteria for what counted as a health equity tool. It had to have an explicit goal of improving health equity. It had to have some kind of action such as steps, a framework, strategies, um, to achieve that goal, and it could either assess, promote, or measure health equity or um, inequities. So within the inventory, um, it's useful uh, to think about the fact that among those currently 112 tools, there are different kinds of tools that require different levels of resource intensity. Um, and NCCDH came up with this really useful framework um, a number of years ago where you can think about the tools in some cases there are checklists and, a lens, and lenses. So these are often requiring less intensity in terms of the resources that are needed and they're generally things that might be used in everyday um, kind of practice. Um, around uh, integrating health equity. Processes, and these are increasing in the amount of re resource intensity, are things like health equity impact assessments that can be used to guide and support a more comprehensive or structured planning approach. So they require more resources and if anyone, I know in Ontario you have a lot of experience working with health impact assessment tools. We have some experience here in BC and they're generally, you know, require a fair bit of data collection and resource intensity. And then third, there are tools that are really about how do we uh, support structures. So uh, things that can be developed and implemented as part of public health organizations to support the implementation of a health equity approach throughout um, the organization. So there's something that's structurally built, built into it um, as well, which is meaning, you know, broader reach, but um, often more challenging because it means everybody has to take up. Um, if you took like BC, we've got a health equity lens built in the guiding framework um, for public health. Or you could think about a health equity office or officer or staff. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the resource 
of the health equity inventory itself. Um, and in it, there is um, about eight, nine different categories of tools. And so you can see one of the first tools is the equity-focused health impact assessment. So there's a section that is all about different variations of that particular tool. But there are some other tools apart from equity-focused health impact assessment that are used in planning assessment and evaluation. Then there's a section that, re that has indicators and measures in it. So how, do you, how would you monitor health equity? How would you measure health equity? D, integrating health equity into organizations and systems. And we separated that out from E, which is integrating health equity into programs and services. And then there's a section on competencies, training, capacity building. So how do we develop our human resource workforce? Um, then there's population specific approaches, and that's where you would find uh, tools related to gender, uh, re related to indigenous approaches, and then community engagement and empowerment resources. How do you work with communities? And then there's a section on health equity frameworks for research. The, uh, what you see in front of you now is a page from the inventory. And for every one of the 112 tools, the page is set up the same way. It's got the purpose on the left-hand side, and it also says who is it meant to be used by. So the question there is who would use it. So it was who did the developers think would be um, the ideal people to kind of using this tool. And then you have a description of the actual tool, so it's a summary. It, uh, you can see in this one, this was uh, for assessing health equity and clinical practice guidelines. And that tool consists of five questions, um, which you can see there. You can also see that we have keywords and then we have applications. And under uh, the applications, this tells you who has actually applied this tool. So you could look at an example such as the one there, of someone who's also applied it. What you do not see on this page is anything about evaluation, and that's because many health equity tools have not been evaluated. Um, and so the ones that have been evaluated, and if there's a report of that evaluation, then you would see another category on here um, about uh, evaluation. And so as I said, every page is set up the same for all of the 112 tools in the inventory. And I just want to reiterate what I said on the previous um, slide is that many tools have been applied, so you can find a fair few applications, but you will not find a lot of evaluations at this point, um, remembering that when we did this last, it was 2016, so that's just over a year and, and a bit ago um, to do that. So in the inventory, um, because of this gap in evaluating tools, um, we actually came up with a set of criteria, which is basically about 11 questions that we've included in the ELF Health Equity Inventory. And um, the interesting um, or useful kind of thing about this that you would want to know is we developed it from our research um, in the ELF project. And so there's basically three areas that we laid out for assessment of health equity tools, uh, classification, practical criteria, and theoretical criteria. So the first set of criteria is really about figuring out what kind of tool you want and whether or not there's a tool in the inventory that fits. So we called it classification because there's many, many tools. There's a hundred um, and 12 of them, and so um, we wanted to give people a set of questions to see if they were getting the right tool for, their per for whatever purpose they had in mind. And so if you sort of pre-identify and say, you know, I'm looking for a tool to do, um, I want to develop health equity indicators, 
then you would look in that section on indicators and see is the, you know, you'd look at those tools and say is there, is the purpose of the tool clearly described? Is it, is it really about indicators? Does what they say their purposes match the content of the tool? Who do they think this should be used for? Are they, are you planning to use the tool for its intended purpose and are there additional resources? So that's where you might look for are there um, applications um, or not. So here's an example. Um, if you are able to click on this link, um, you will go to a tool called the Capacity Building Tool and um, just go to the table of contents of the inventory. I think Diane has posted the link for that. And click on the link, go to the table of contents, see if you can find this tool, and then just look and see um, what the purpose of that tool is. Pretty just excited. Giving I'd like people to do that now, right? Yes, please. It's we Section F. And we thought it would be a good chance for people to take an actual look at, um, at that tool, right? Yeah, we just picked that one out randomly. Um, and you can see it's a tool that helps to build and raise awareness of actions uh, to address the social determinants of health. And um, as you remember the sections that I was going through earlier, it's in Section F which is about competencies, training, capacity building, and education. So if you were thinking, I really want something, to, something that would help me um, in my organization to build some awareness and capacity, you might look at a tool like this, and you could you know, ask those questions in the inventory um, for that purpose. And so it's on page 94 of the inventory, and um, you can see there the purpose, who's meant to use it, and a description. So then you could just use those classification questions to say, is this really the right tool for me? Is this the one um, that I want to do? Hmm. Now, thus classification and finding the right tool for your purpose is one consideration, but then another really important consideration is, is this tool even useful? Like, is it practical? Am I going to be able to use it kind of given the resources um, that I have. So we did a project within ELF. We used a methodology called concept mapping, where you just ask the group one question. Um, and our question was, to be useful, a health equity tool should. And so we did that with a, a broad range of groups of people within public health. Um, we've written this up elsewhere, so I'm not going to go through um, the methodology. Um, but the outcome of that exercise was uh, six clusters of criteria for assessing whether or not a health equity tool is practical. And so you can see these colored clusters that, that contain a number of statements about um, what is in each cluster. And so what people said um, we'll just start at the top with uh, the large one called health equity competencies. Um, people said that health equity, people had to have the competencies and skills to be able to use a health equity tool. That, that would make it, that's just a practical consideration, and there's a number of competencies that are laid out there. Uh, the tool to be practical had to be grounded in theoretical, explicit theoretical foundations. So people were looking for things, the fact that it was grounded in social justice and it was consistent with public health values. If you look at the green one, practical resources to guide use. So people didn't just want a tool. They said to be practical, it had to have some kind of book or template with it. It needed to be user friendly. So it needed to be easily understood. It didn't, um, couldn't have a lot of resource demands um, on them. There ha and then if you move to the red one, um, people identified that it was really important that the outcome of this tool would result in some kind of improvement and that there was a way of tracking that improvement, that it actually made a difference. And then the brown 
probably last, but most importantly, even though it's a small cluster, people said we needed to make sure um, that it engaged with people who, uh, for whom we want to affect improvements. And you'll recognize there the pop popular phrase is nothing about me without me. So in other words, um, including and engaging uh, people um, in the use of that um, tool. So that was the practical criteria. So what we did then is we basically looked at those practical criteria and in the criteria in the template that's included in the inventory, you will find these six questions that you can ask, of your, ask yourself when you're selecting a tool. Will the tool contribute to improvements in programs or policies? Will the tool contribute to identification of specific actions to improve health equity? Is there a step in the tool that engages or calls for participation of um, community or people affected by health equity inequities? Is the tool easy to understand and use? Is it quick, and, quick to use and short? And is there a clear set of steps that guide use? Um, we also have, and I would say this section of the criteria is um, probably something um, that we are definitely still developing and working on um, around whether it's also a theoretically sound tool. So is it rooted in those values of public health? Is it rooted in um, inequitable distribution of health via power and inequitable distribution of power and resources? And so one place to start, is there a definition of health equity? Is there an explanation of health equity? Um, how well equities either were promoted or how health inequities be reduced? Do they cite any references? Um, do you see people, uh, you know, do you see references about social justice, for example? Um, or are they talking about some kind of, of theory? So this is, um, I would say, you know, a more optional set of questions, but if you even looked at the first couple, like is there a definition of health equity? And then what do they define as health equity? Because you could actually go back to those definitions that Sana provided um, at the beginning of her session and say, gosh, are they talking about a definition of health equity about unnecessary, unfair um, inequities in health and inequitable distribution of power and resources. So you could refer back to those kinds of definitions that are rooted in social justice to see if it's theoretically sound. Um, so uh, just to kind of pull together and summarize this part is that finding a tool is important, but even as important is finding the right tool. So it's not just finding a tool that matters, it's actually finding the right tool that's fit for your purpose, and that's kind of that middle cog there. So getting the tool right, fit for purpose. Are you looking to integrate equity into a program? Are you in a health equity impact assessment planning process? Do you want to work with capacity building in your organization? Um, because those are all different kinds of purposes, and you can see the inventory has a range of tools to suit those purposes. Um, then it's more than having a tool. It's also the equity competencies. And then it's also recognizing that within health uh, organizations, we need to have um, organizational capacity around mandates, accountability, and leadership in our organizations to actually fully implement so that we're not just implementing, you know, a one-off tool, but we're actually, people understand and are actually implementing the tool as broader organizational change and capacity building. Um, much of what I've shared with you is in some of our ELSE KTE resources, and you can see two of them there on the screen. Um, one of them that summarizes up, it's not just the tool, uh, it's, it's more than the tool that matters, and we've identified them there. And then also making health equity a priority, which talks about um, the, the conditions in an organization 
to strengthen um, health equity as a priority. And all of this has come out of um, the ELF um, research project, to which we are very grateful um, to our funders, Canadian Institute of Health Research Public Health, and the Public Health Agency um, of Canada. So um, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it back to Diane, I believe, and we're going to have good time for questions. That's great, Bernie. I was just unmuting there. Thank you very, very much. Um, so we do have a few questions um, coming in, and thank you to Santa as well. I'm really so pleased with the interaction and the, the, the comments in the chat box and how many people that this is new information for. And um, so the, you know, it's really getting out there, and it's really um, we shall have become more aware of it before today. I'm going to go back and take a look at some of the questions. And certainly, if there are more questions that come up um, as we're talking here, please post them in the, in the chat box here, and we'll get to them. So if I go back to the beginning, uh, one of the first questions was from Christina Sicko. Um, how would you encourage doctors working in primary care to bring that population health, um, health equity topic to the forefront to um, help affect change for some of their patients. So how do we handle that? Diane, do you want me to take that question, Diane? Yeah, sure. That would be great. Okay, so this is Bernie. Um, it's a really good question because, you know, recognizing that primary care is an entry, a really important entry point into the health system, and often that might be the only access um, that people have in terms of uh, access into the healthcare system. So we're looking at how do we enhance equitable access, um, which is an important part of the system. Um, on the chat box, and I apologize, I don't know who posted it. Um, I'm guessing it might have been someone from North Lambton. Um, there's a study called EQUIP, which is actually a sister study to ELF, or a sibling study to ELF. Um, where uh, they've developed tools for health equity, uh, integrating health equity into primary care. So that's a really great resource, and it's particularly primary care um, related to socioeconomic disadvantages, um, as particularly. So that's a good resource, and there's an excellent um, set of articles for physicians, particularly around training physicians in uh, health equity competencies and criteria for that that really highlight the importance of understanding um, structural determinants of health in medical education because that's not a background um, necessarily that physicians, I mean clearly public health physicians do, but um, many physicians who are, are uh, being trained do not necessarily have that um, background. So that's another resource. And I think what's important to keep in mind is that that focuses on health equity at the individual level um, and equitable access to the system and understanding better the structural determinants of that as opposed to in public health, we're often thinking about inequitable health outcomes, not just for an individual, but for a whole population. And so that's a different set of uh, resources and tools. So thank you for that question. Uh, Diane, there's a couple other here I can do if you want. Sure. I was just, I wanted to pick up on that one though, just for a second, because, um, you know, I think, um, it, you know, what we need to, from a public health perspective, um, you know, we need to think about public health's role interacting with physicians and clinical practice as well, right? Because certainly um, public health's role looks at inequities on a population level, uh, not an individual level, like you said. So, you know, is there a role there for public health to work with some of our primary care practitioners um, in, in partnership or in, in uh, collaboration in some way? I mean, my immediate response is yes, um, there should be good partnerships, and I think someone might have been posting it um, as well between public health and primary care, but I just want to be mindful that primary care often, at least in our context, is focused on individuals not and changing 
um, you know, obviously more equitable outcomes for individuals, whereas population health is working at the community or population level. And so I think that's where we have to navigate, you know, some of those differences so that public health is not simply sucked into primary care. Yeah, yeah that's very good. Okay, so there is another question here from Lauren. Um, have any of the tools had an outcome or impact evaluation? What were the results of effectiveness? Um, and how do you suggest we can, we can evaluate a tool or an approach? Um, that's a really good question. And there are a few. And my suggestion would be um, that if you look, even if you just scan, the inventory is a PDF. So if you type in evaluation into the find box, you will find all of the tools that have an evaluation and the resource um, will be there. So for example, um, on page 17, there is the Equity Focused Health Impact Assessment Framework, which has um, uh, evaluations uh, that have been done listed on the page for that. So you would look in there. The other one I know that has one is the um, equity audit um, has one and there's a couple of others and you could look at those to see. Uh, some of them are process evaluations, so they're more in terms of how were they applied as opposed to outcome evaluations. So there's a limited number um, of outcome evaluations, unfortunately. So Lots of, uh, anybody who's a student or doing research, you might be interested in, in that, because it's definitely a, um, a gap. That would be a good, good uh, dissertation project, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, so yeah. we've got um, a question from Megan, Megan Sim of Nova Scotia Health Authority. Um, the increase in health equity tools from the first one uh, to the second one is, is pretty huge. And so what category of tools has evolved? Did you notice um, that's a good that? question. And I, if Heather or Santa, you have any um, thoughts on it, I'll just give my kind of quick recollection. Um, because uh, Megan, you also asked, uh, did we follow the same process? We followed the same process, but we did add the key word of social justice, which we didn't have in the first inventory. And it came to light after the first inventory that there were some tools that were clearly aimed at health equity or health inequities, but they didn't have that languaging in it. And so we used the search term of social justice, which definitely added um, to categories of, of tools. Some of the categories that are pretty big and that have grown is, uh, for example, in the equity-focused health impact assessment area, there were more applications and more types of equity-focused um, health impact assessment. And another area which there weren't very really any tools in the first one was some of those ones around um, organizational capacity building, training, um, equity kinds of, of competencies. Um, there was definite additions um, in those areas. So, so those are some of the ones um, that I recall as um, being developed. And Heather's nodding her head saying, yeah, that sounds, uh, <laughs> she's in agreeing with me and I like it when Heather agrees with me. Yeah. So Heather Strozier is the, um, the research assistant, right, for the, the project? That's, That's right. right. Yeah. Research. Uh, associate and she she added a lot um, in terms of she did a tremendous amount of work on those categories that you um, see there. That's great. Um, okay, we have another question from Diana Dyckhofer. Uh, has there been any work done to offer the tools as part of a cohesive process? So, um, if you have a tool to assess where you are now and then what the gaps are and how to fill them, I guess um, touching on all stages. Yeah, um, I don't know if Santa or anyone else wants to comment on that one. Can you just read the question again? Because I may not have understood it correctly. Um, so it's, 
if, has there been any work done to offer the tools as part of a cohesive process? Um, so, you know, the, the different steps, the tool to assess where you are now, what the gaps are, and how to fill them. I think that's a really good um, example. What you'd be looking for is examples of how the tool's been applied because, you know, I think what you described is, um, you know, so for example, if you wanted to find a tool to evaluate either your program or your organization in terms of where they were and where they were going, then I would look at tools and applications of tools in Section D and Section E of the inventory. So integrating health equity into organizations and systems and integrating health equity into programs and um, service delivery. Um, and Diane, you're going to have to help me on this. I do recall a tool that was being developed by um, a nurse, um, who was in a, a, I think, a public health leadership role that was also aimed at doing an assessment over time in terms of organizations and where they were at with, with health equity. And she, she co-presented with us, Diane, I think at Canadian Public Health Association. Can you help yeah, me out? Right. So yeah, so that was um, Giovanna Good from the Lambton Health Unit, Public Health Unit in Ontario. And um, I put up a link to uh, our sessions there um, at the CPHA conference in 2017, last June. And um, it, it really, it's this amazing framework and tool for assessing public health organizational capacity to do health equity work specifically. So looking at the capacity at an individual level, at a leadership level, at an organizational level. Um, it assesses what types of supports and information are in place now, what else would be needed to help move um, capacity forward. And so that entire organizational assessment process is a tool itself, right? Yeah, and that was, um, it's in the process of being developed, and I don't know, I think it is, a, I think a form of it is available. The other one I point you to um, that's in the inventory, if your interest is around, you know, assessing organizational capacity and looking to see if it's changed, is Benita Cohen has a tool that she developed, um, and it is in the inventory, and it's in that section D of integrating health equity into organizations and systems. I think this conversation that we're having right now is just such a good example of, you know, the first step really is figuring out what kind of tool are you looking for, um, you know, and so you can see from, you know, the nine different categories in the inventory, there's a lot of different kinds of tools. And so even just looking at that table of contents probably gives you some clues as to what's available and where you might want to look for the tool that, you know, a tool that you're interested in. So we've got a few more questions that we'll try and uh, get through quickly. Hannah Moffat in, in Winnipeg is wondering, is there a plan to redo the tools inventory? So there's a, two, a version 2.0. Will there be a 3.0? That's a great question, Hannah. Um, do you think you could talk to CIHR or public health? Because <laughs> basically, ELF um, was funded for six years, and we're just at the end of our, our six years. So we do not have a plan um, to update the inventory, but I would be delighted if someone um, wanted to do that and, and you know, if there was an interest in working on it. Because I think we learned a lot from developing those first two inventories. Um, we've got a number of publications coming out on the inventory itself, um, both you know, in our KT resources. We've got um, publications under review around the practical criteria and are developing things around the theoretical criteria. So we have a lot of um, you know, resources and have developed the systematic review process which would mean that if someone's interested in taking that up and developing a 3.0, um, we've got a lot already developed um, in that. Um, but at this point, um, 
we don't have any plans. Yeah, but you know, it's it's um, it's interesting to think about the, the criteria that you presented today around classification and um, you know the other pieces, the theoretical piece, the practical piece. Those criteria, even if even if the tool isn't in your inventory, so if someone comes across a new tool, they can use those criteria, right, to apply to future tools that might become available. Yes, that's an excellent point, Diane. Is the criteria could be used for any health equity tool to assess, you know, do you have the right tool, um, you know, is it practical and is it theoretically sound? Yep. Okay. Um, so we have a question here from Eileen Hyman. Not, oh wait, I lost it there. There it is. Has data analysis come up as an issue? So a lot of organizations collect, you know, reams and reams of data, but they don't really have the capacity to analyze it. Um, or to identify the health or social inequities, you know, access outcomes. So um, is data analysis an issue? Yes, absolutely. Um, so for example, you know, we have tools, well, there's two issues. Um, one issue is, do we have the right data? And so if you look at, for example, section C of the index, that's about indicators and measures and trying to find um, the right approach to assessing and measuring health inequities. So that's one issue. Do we have the right data? Because you're absolutely right. We could collect reams of data, but is it the right, right data to give us the kind of information? And, and many times we don't have good data on the structural determinants. That's often what's lacking in, in data systems. Um, it's certainly something we deal with in research as well around the kind of survey data we have is often lacking in, in you know, data that would help us look at the upstream uh, causes or the causes of the causes of health um, inequities. The second um, issue that you identified, which is a huge one, is the capacity to um, work with what data is available. And so, um, and I think there are, because health, equity focused health impact assessment has such a huge uptake because it's mandated in, in Ontario, um, I think, you know, you have some people who are very um, familiar with some of the issues related to um, accessing and having data. So I don't know, um, uh, I think some of them might be on the line actually, um, to speak to how they've addressed that issue because, um, you know, within a public health program, there's often very little, sometimes they don't have the data, and when they do have the data, there's not a lot of capacity, or the capacity that they have is in population health, um, who might be a very small department. Um, or at least, and I'm speaking in my BC context, so there may be ways in other provinces that that, that capacity to analyze that data has been um, addressed. Okay. Uh, we, have a, we have a question from Karen Sarwanka. Um, did you do any, uh, review any tools around um, integrated impact assessment with human rights components? Because there's lots of movement and um, interest in, in doing that work sort of beyond one sector, right? That's a fantastic question. And um, I'm going to say from my recollection, I don't recall a lot around human rights, um, partly because we were probably looking at organizational capacity or organized tools that could be used in the um, health system, and not to say that couldn't be. I don't, what I would suggest you do is just go into the inventory, and as I mentioned before, it's a PDF, so just put human rights into the find function, and if there was anything that intersected with um, human rights, um, it would come up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we had some, it was, it was sort of question, sort of comment. Um, from Eileen um, in the chat box, and it was um, asking, uh, following up a little bit on, on um, data managers and how you know data managers and agencies need some direction to 
be able to use that data. So we're back sort of at the, the data indicator piece. And, you know, what type of sample sizes are needed to be able to look at intersectionality? Who is using services? Are there equitable outcomes? So, um, you know, for those that are, are struggling with data-related um, issues, can you, can you comment any, any further on where they might, how they might sort of get to the, <laughs> not to the bottom, but, are they, you know, how they might uh, figure it out? Diane, you're thinking in terms of being able to access data, right? Um, I think yeah, I think access data, and, and again, it's the interpreting it correctly, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's a region by region and a province by province question. And I noticed someone posted in in the chat box, um, you know, looking at the uh, BC staff and socioeconomic profiles. So that might be an example in BC where you can locate um, some data. But what you always have to be mindful of is, are they actually giving you data that points to the more upstream uh, determinants or structural determinants? So I'll just take an example from uh, my own work in <coughs> our region. We wanted to look at uh, housing and income as determinants of homelessness. So we weren't, you know, going out and surveying people who are homeless. What we were actually doing was looking at the structural conditions in which people um, become homeless um, and recognizing that housing and income are not the full story for sure, but they are two determinants that at a, at a systems level um, need to shift because, and, and part of this was because when we did do interviews and surveys with people who were experiencing homelessness, they kept saying to us over and over again, we can't afford the housing um, in in this community and housing is largely unavailable and they would describe to me in great detail how much income they were receiving on income assistance. So we created some indicators around housing and income to highlight how what people were saying was impacting their ability to move out of homelessness, um, huge impacting factors on their ability um, was housing um, and income, and so then we created some, we called them report cards um, on housing and income. And other communities have done this as well. I know Ottawa um, has done something like that as well. Um, in Saskatchewan, um, they did kind of neighborhood level indicators. Probably the best example is the work that Corey Newdorf in Saskatchewan has done is a really good one, looking at uh, community level indicators of socioeconomic deprivation. And so you can really have to have um, the right kind of indicators um, yep, to, to do that. We so I think you need to work stuff. with someone. Sorry, say that again. Sorry. I was going to say, so it really does take, I mean, that's a good example of where it's really important work but it takes the resources of a team to support that kind of work. Um, you know, I mean, if we're talking about something beyond, you know, grabbing some ready, readily available basic stats and trying to interpret them. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have one last question and then we'll, we'll need to tie up. Um, it's from Kathy. So um, she's, she's asking, could you talk about culturally sensitive approaches in health equity? And, um, how do we assess those? Do you come across any tools around around that oh. cultural competence uh, sensitivity safety? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say, I mean, cultural sensitivity, or um, actually, I would move now. We would talk about cultural safety and assessing power and privilege and how to create culturally safe spaces. In that regard, I don't, uh, there's not a lot of tools in the inventory. Um, 
partly because I not sure, and maybe someone on the line has some suggestions, as to how many tools there are out there around cultural safety and assessment of cultural safety. There are some around cultural sensitivity um, in Section G under population-specific approaches, um, which talk more about engaging in culturally sensitive ways um, across difference. But I think um, there's not anything in there specifically around cultural safety and recognizing um, for, on the behalf of the provider um, the power and privilege. But um, in BC, probably one of the most, and this is a really super excellent, I think, example of a structural, support structural piece. In BC, there's cultural safety training available through Provincial Health Services Authority. And I believe um, that uh, not every health authority, but some health authorities have developed additional training for staff around cultural safety. And then there is, uh, I know Ontario, ha in some of the primary health care programs, have been developing cultural safety training, which you could think of as a tool for building competencies. But then you still have to say, OK, how is that impacting change um, in our program? Um, is it, do people feel more culturally safe? And I'm aware, at least in BC, of a number of evaluations that are being undertaken in that regard, um, including um, the EQUIP project, which was mentioned earlier. OK, well, thank you, Bernie. That was, um, you, were, you were really on the spot there for those questions. And um, with that, we are at our time, and we need to wrap up. So. I would just really like to thank Bernie and Santa both and the entire ELF team. Um, they have been wonderful friends of the MCCDH, and they do amazing work, and we're really, really thankful to, to collaborate with them. Um, I have uh, put the slide up with the link to the evaluation survey. It will take you about one minute to do, um, but we really, really um, appreciate your feedback. and. I will absolutely share uh, a summary of today, uh, as all the links that were shared in the chat box, um, references to different resources and summary of discussion, and that, that will come um, probably in the next probably two or three weeks from now, um, but I'll do my best to get it out very soon. And certainly, if you've got any questions, you can feel very free to contact us at any time. So thank you very much to everyone. and. Um, Enjoy your day. Go use those tools. Bye.